hello, everyone, being plural, you two. Hello. <laughs> hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome back to Frank Film Club. Um, we're so excited, aren't we, to be back. Truly, we're back with a new series. It's been a while. It's been a little while. It's been a long time, I feel. Mm -hmm. So what have you been up to over summer? Well, I've been filming a new TV show. And it's been amazing working with Apple TV for the first time. Um, and they're wonderful. And yeah, the show is about Christian Dior and Coco Chanel. And I play Christian Dior's sister, Catherine. Um, but it's all kind of set in the 40s. And so we've been doing sort of like Nazi occupied France uh, during like that time period. And so as you can imagine, it's like not the most jokey, fun and lighthearted of shows. I'm grateful to be back doing Frank Film Club, basically. What about you, Larry? How have you been? Well, you know what I've been up to. We've been in development of a load of different films and a series and trying to get a load of different things off the ground. And also got a van. Yeah. And I'm doing up a van that hopefully one day I'm going to live in. And it's all very... Instagrammable. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm very good on Instagram. I know I was going to say, you're holding out on the content. I, <laughs> I know. I've got so many photos, I just need to post. I just need, need a page to put them on. Yeah, it's going well. How about you? Yeah, I've been good. I've been busy and working on theatre a lot, which has been really different for a performance because I like everything to be very small. And it's obviously been literally the opposite of that. So it's been it's been a learning curve, but it's been really, really cool because I feel like, I don't know, I feel like I'm learning another muscle that actors need to have and then how that can transfer into film. So been great, been working with a wonderful girl called Bridget in the office and we're hitting a stride. It feels nice. And I went to Bali, sure. Everyone went to Bali this year, I went to Bali. So we've got some wicked films coming up a lot of really big hitters. So ones that everybody's talking about, but we're gonna come at it from a bit of a different way, hopefully talking about the filmmaking process. And the first one is Don't Worry Darling. So much has been said about this film and I'm excited to talk about it, but I'm excited to talk about the things that maybe haven't been spoken about so much with this film because it is a bit of a moment in the press, but it is a bit of a moment also, I think, for um, what the film is. So the film um, premiered at Venice this year. It's directed by Olivia Wilde. It's starring Florence Pugh, Harry Styles, Chris Pine, Nick Kroll, Gemma Chan, Cindy Chandler, Kiki Lane. Um, and it is set in the 1950s or so we think, and Alice and Jack live in this idealized community of victory, but nothing is really what it seems. Yes, what did you think? Well, um, I enjoyed this film. I found it entertaining. I feel like I'd heard so much about it before going in to watch it. Um, and so, and I've heard like so many reviews before going in to watch it and like really mixed. So it was quite like a weird viewing experience because I was like, I don't know how I feel about this film and hopefully I'm going to figure out those feelings today because I'm still pretty unsure. But all in all, like I found it entertaining and it was visually beautiful. But there were also some parts that I was like, hmm, questionable. I too like could not escape kind of like the media circus that surrounded this film for so many reasons, but like none of which, like in my viewing experience, I was like, but why is no one talking about these parts? Um, so yeah, it was kind of hard to like pick my own sort of feelings throughout that. But what I will say is I too found it very entertaining. I was gripped. I couldn't believe that it was two hours 20 or something like that. I thought it flowed really well. I thought there are a number of performances that were really, really sensational. I thought visually it was beautiful. I thought like the twist was amazing, but I will say that I have a couple of issues with the story in other ways. Um, and that really did affect the rest of my viewing experience because if it's gonna look spectacular I think that the story needs to be like the most spectacular part and maybe it wasn't uh, it was hard to go into there without like a preconception of like what you were going to experience when you saw it and to form your own opinion on it which is exactly like why we uh, do this because we want to form our own opinions and like be able to talk about that so that was difficult but then the, for me I got lost I didn't pick up on a plot point 
when she goes off course and she goes into like the the dome, like headquarters thing, I didn't understand what happened there. And then throughout the rest of the film, then I was like, okay, well, it feels like high stakes. It feels like something's going on, but I didn't connect until I left the cinema and Warren was like, no, she woke up. She woke up in the real world and then she was going, like remembering things from the real world. And I was like, no, missed that, completely missed it. Yeah. Am I dumb? No, uh, no. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't feel like there was no reason for you to know that she woke up in the real world at that point, but I, all I knew at that point was that she had seen something that made her know that something was up. Yeah, I think it would have been more impactful for me as a viewer to know what she saw because it, it felt very ambiguous that she saw something, but it wasn't like super clear what she saw. And then so when she was like getting more irate and like anxious, I was like, yeah, but what did you see? I want to know what you saw. Yeah. At that point, is the audience supposed to know or are they not? Is she supposed to know or not? It, like there were parts of the story that were not detailed enough or weren't outlined strongly enough to make the other parts be like ambiguous. There was like too many sort of like suggestive parts that when you find out the twist, even that isn't like explained enough in, in ways. Let's talk about what did you love about that film? I loved the choreography of it. I thought it looked beautiful. I thought all of the movement of like, whether it's cars, whether it's people, whether it's like the world, I thought it looked incredible. Whatever it was referencing, nailed it. Like just completely new world, a place that I wanted to be. <laughs> the utopia of victory, want to be there. Like the, the score, like the, the performances, like I was with it, I was with it, with it, with it. I mean, I just love Florence Pugh. I think she's an absolutely amazing actress and I could just watch her like forever. Also thought, I loved Olivia Wilde's character as well. I thought she was great. Um, yeah, Bunny. Yeah, yeah, I thought she was fab. Um, I thought most of the actors were great in it and I did just like enjoy spending time with them and I like felt quite on edge um, when these strange things were happening. But as we kind of said before, I didn't really know how I, why I felt edge and like why that was relevant, but still it did work. Like I did feel the feels that I think I was meant to be feeling. Um, but yeah, it was beautiful and the mu the soundtrack was amazing. And yeah, what about you? I, I loved everything that you've just said. I also think that like, so Olivia Wilde has said, I wanted to create this word, exactly what you're saying, like victory to be this utopia that you sort of just want Florence Pugh's character to just be like, oh, just stay, just don't worry, just stay. You don't need to go back to the real world. And like the conflict in that of being like, fooling yourself into thinking that something is what it isn't basically. Um, and I love all of the different like things that this is based around. So like um, gaslighting, incels, cults, like, you know, Chris Pine's characters feels like very culty. I love all of those as like separate things and I think they're done really well and I think that that's testament to the acting definitely and probably the writing but I don't know yeah just the just how it's all strung together I think that's what we're talking about like that's not that's not it for us. Well I'm sure you've read more about this but I do know that they had to sort of do reshoots of this and go back and add other little pieces and like they did test audiences and and so it was one of those ones where like on you know the scripts is like can be solid and then you start shooting you realize the things that we thought were obvious aren't as obvious we need to add more story here we need to take some away from here da, 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 da. it happens to movies all the time so you know it has been a victim of that a little bit but that's like there's not a reason for it to you know not be good because i think there's so many parts that are good so should we speak a bit about how the film got made. Yeah. So this film was on the blacklist in 2019. Oh, right. Just as the, as the script? As the script. Olivia Wilde took it on and she wrote it, or, or rather she bought on her writer from Booksmart. Have you both seen Booksmart? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, and she rewrote the script before they made it. Oh, any guesses on, any guesses on the budget for Booksmart? Like, Eight million? Uh, yeah, I'd probably go around similar, maybe six? Yeah, it's hilarious. Six. Oh, great. 
Jeez. You would think she's a producer. <laughs> um, and what about this? Don't worry, darling. I feel like a lot. Yeah. Like, like 12? No, I feel like... Even 40? Okay. No, maybe that's too much. 20. <laughs> it's 20. 20. Okay. Well, so after Booksmart, Shirley Olivia Well got approached by quite a few um, people wanted to make comedies and put in her as um, the director, but she wanted to make something which felt like a psychological horror, but then like tie it into a lot of topics, you know, that feel politically like what is happening right now. And um, yeah, and that's why she decided to do it. Um, did you know much about her work? Because I felt like when Booksmart came out, I was like, Olivia Wilde. I was surprised. Like I didn't realize that she was a director. That was her debut feature though, no? Yeah, but I was like, did she just di do this and not do anything before? But she started making shorts and music videos 10 years ago. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, no, missed that. I didn't know that. No. Oh, cool. That's also quite nice to know that like, she's kind of like, she's put the work in for that. But, yeah. Um, to get to that point as well. So should we talk about the casting? Yeah. Okay, I got two questions for you. <gasps> Who was originally cast, or who do you think was originally cast to play Florence Pugh's character? Oh. Oh. I don't know, this is a guess. Was it Olivia? Yes. Well, I had wondered, like, was surely that was a conversation at some point because like, would she not just want to play that role? Why was she not, why did she not? The, it's sort of been different in a couple of different articles that I've read in the telling of the story, but. I think the long and the short of it is, when Olivia came on as a director, they attached her to it as an actor for financial like, selling purposes, I think. She met Florence after seeing Midsommar, and this was before Little Women came out, she was nominated for you know awards and stuff for Little Women. She met with Florence Pugh to, to play the role of Bunny, which is the role that she ended up playing. And then when she met Florence Pugh, she was like, no, you absolutely have to be the lead. That was an excellent choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I can't imagine the stress of directing and playing Bunny. But like to play Alice, like that's, she's in every shot. She's just such an emotional character to play and it's like quite harrowing for her. So to just be like having the worst time in the world and then be like, cut, okay, how did that look? And also like Bunny kind of like knows what's going on like the whole time and has this like other knowledge of the whole situation and is trying to keep a lid on it. And I feel like also being the director, like you must have to have that. Well, you yeah, you have that view on it anyway. You know the twist, you know, you know, and you want to protect it. And like that's, you know, the, the two roles are like similar and like, it's like a knowingness to to both of, to both of those roles. Yeah, so true. I think you probably already know the answer to this one, but who was originally cast to play? Mm. Who? What are you gonna say? Harry Styles' character, <laughs> <laughs> Louis Tomlinson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <I'm kidding. laughs> um, Shia LaBeouf. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. 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 Ooh. Yeah. Well, what did you think of Harry Styles in the role? Well, I really, really wanted to love him in the role because I, I feel like he's had a lot of um, negative reviews. Uh, I think even in Dunkirk, but I gotta say, I really liked him in Dunkirk. I think he was great. Um, so I, I've been like trying to champion him, but I don't know if they quite hit in quite a few moments. I think, I think there were quite a few moments where I didn't believe that he fully, fully loved her and that it wasn't quite going on. However, when it gets to the end and there's a reveal that he's actually a very different guy to what we kind of think he is, I was like, oh, I wonder if he's like trying to play into that, which would make sense. And that in that way, it's meant that he's like a bit more like emotionless. And I don't know, I'm trying to make excuses. I think it is a really good like take on it. I think that the character would have benefited from being like playing a bit more of that duality from having like a little bit more of like knowing and being a bit more obvious with some of those things. And and I think that what they've done is like the really good thing to do. I think like they've really, they've not overexposed him. I think they've like made the character smaller and they've like worked with what they've got and they've like, you know, formed it into something that, that works. 
it's not the best version of what this could have been. But I think that it's better to do that than to push someone into a position that is like, they're maybe like just not ready for. I mean, I, that sounds like really mean, but it's just like, it's not, acting isn't easy. <laughs> like everyone can't do it. Like that's kind of just like the way that it is. I feel like they've handled it really well by not completely like, oh yeah, over playing that character and pushing him to do things that like isn't working. And it's, and it's, and it's work, it's, it's fallen into a good place. There's no, there's, uh, the thing is, I was like, I'm in an hour and about bringing this up because I think it's sad that he's open to so much scrutiny because he's such a mega star to be put into something. I think there's always going to be people looking at him with a magnifying glass. And I think that he did, a, like, I, I People, no doubt, went to, and we'll speak about the marketing of the film in a minute, but no doubt people went to see this film because he's in it. Like, absolutely no doubt. I think it's it's quite strange watching him on something because he sparkles, like, on stage and even in a picture. Like, you look at him and you're like, what, like wow. Like, he's so... You can't not look at him. But when he's acting... It's like some of that goes away, and I don't know what that is. But he doesn't pop off the screen as much as you think he would. He would. He's still really interesting to watch, I think, but he's not as interesting as what I think he should be, or yeah. would be, or could be. No, I really agree with you there. Like I, it just felt slightly flat at times when you just wanted him to really pop. Like it doesn't matter how good he ever is going to be at playing Jack. It's never going to be as good as he is at playing Harry. Yeah, that's the thing. Like he's great. Like, you're, you're, doing, you're doing it so well. Like you are the best version of yourself. Yeah. Like when you are yourself, you. It's like women want to be with you. Men want to be. You, men want to be with you. Like yeah. It's yeah. Mm. And so. Yeah. Um. Can I just say though, when twist happens and you see Harry. In this completely other look. I didn't recognise who it was for a second. I was like, who's this new guy? <laughs> and then realised that that was Harry Styles and was like, oh my gosh. Imagine Harry Styles hadn't won the X Factor. And that was him. And actually, they didn't win the X Factor, <laughs> did they? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I, was like, I didn't think he would have gone that. You never know. He might have got really sad because his dreams didn't come true. Yeah, Harry Styles, if Nicole Scherzinger didn't give him a yes. OMG. Well, we're going to speak about everything everywhere all at once um, in a few episodes time. And that's like alternate realities. Like what could have happened? That could be his alternate <laughs> reality. It yeah. did make me think, you know. I was shit. like, shit, he went on the right one on this one. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank yeah. goodness. Well, I feel like we should speak about the marketing of this film. And press frenzy and intentional, not intentional stuff. Like I, I think we said earlier, I, I don't want to get into the gossip of it. I feel like, I feel really bad for Olivia Wilde, who is an accomplished director, a female director who has been given a budget, which that doesn't happen all the time, that she's been asked questions in interviews that would never be asked of a male director. Like you would never ask personal questions of a male director in an interview about that film. What type of things have been asked? Like about her relationships, about how she's dealing with being a mother, like when she's filming, like all stuff like that that you wouldn't usually be asked. So yeah, yeah, mm. it's not been good. Um, but I wanted to start with the, the use of sex in the film's marketing um, and what you thought of that because when I saw the trailer and I've, my friend Beth, she is obsessed with Harry Styles. She sent me the trailer. She was like, look at this, looks amazing. Cause it's, you know, they're in the trailer, they're getting it on, sure. Um, and when the film was first coming out, Olivia Wilde spoke a lot about there be, it being um, about female pleasure on screen which is a little bit contradictory, I think, when we're talking about them being pr imprisoned in this world that they're having sex in, but sure. Um, and then I, I found this quote from Florence, which I thought was really, well, I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. 
when it's reduced to your sex scene or to watch the most famous man in the world go down on someone, it's not why we do it. It's not why I'm in the industry. Obviously, the nature of hiring the most famous pop star in the world, you're going to have conversations like that. That's just not what I'm going to be discussing because the movie is bigger and better than that and the people who made it are bigger and better than that. So I wonder what you thought about them using a sex scene in the trailer, if you think that that's a problem or if it's not a problem, like, I don't know. It's not an integral part of the story at all. And, like, the fact that that was used as a way to, like, market it, about it being about female pleasure, like... I, I don't think that that's what this film means by any means. And plus you have the duality of knowing the biggest star in the world is going to be like going down on a woman and it's like m lots of young girls dream. <laughs> <laughs> lots of women. Yeah. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> yeah. Strange thing to hook on to. Like, it does draw a, like a an audience in who is like who fancy Harry Styles or like <laughs> yeah like in like a not very good way especially having now watched the film and knowing what the twist is I do think that I do think that linking the film in its like entirety to being about female pleasure is actually not not quite right and I don't know that they should be saying that because that seems a bit strange like she is he's holding her there he think yeah that I don't uh, that doesn't sit well with me. I feel like it's more about like incel men, like right. Uh, in my opinion, I think like that's what it's like. That's like the sort of crux of it. I do think there's a really great female story in there, but maybe this is part of the rewrite. Maybe it was way more about the men in the original draft and then they wanted to like make it more about women but I actually think because of this twist which is you know very good I do think that it's still kind of it's like scrutinizing men but I I do kind of feel like this movie is about men more than it's about women yeah agree and this is um something that I was thinking throughout like the social commentary in the film in general I'm like I feel like it ha I don't think it has that much impact on the world right now because I think it would have had a bigger impact years and years and years ago so in that sense I don't know that it felt quite as like progressive of a film and and it might it could have done a while ago I just didn't quite I don't know quite what it was getting at but also to go back to what you said I think that Olivia Wilde I think what she, one of the first quotes about this was like the no male orgasms in this film it's only about female pleasure I think that coupled with seeing the shot in the trailer of like that explicit scene of Harry Styles, like the biggest star in the world, I think that it did undercut everything that it was truly about or wanted to be about. The things that it wanted to be about, I don't know if it even was about those things, but it wasn't marketed as such either. Well, when the trailer came out, it was just spread like wildfire. And I think so much of the circus around this film has taken away from probably what was meant to be the important things about it. And I, I you can see the you can see the message that is meant to be in this, and I I love that. But I think there's been a lot of voices, probably during the filmmaking and writing process, and then probably since that is just like it's just a lot of a lot of noise and it's really hard to like cut through that but I don't think it do it does what it probably was meant to do but like that's that happens all the time that happens with male directors all the time all the time yeah and it still doesn't become about like a personal thing on them and da, da, da. it's just like you know sometimes it doesn't work out do you think that if this hadn't had all of the press stuff come out that as many people would have would have gone to see it I, st I think that people still would have gone to see it because of Harry Styles. Just the curiosity. When it, well, we're doing it for the first episode, so obviously, like, we, we think it's a good enough topic. I, I definitely think this is one to, like, talk about, and I think n not for that reason, because of the what the subject is. Even if it was, like, lesser-known actors, I think this is an interesting film. Yeah, so, definitely. So it's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that, but I think it's probably been really helpful to them for... 
tickets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like for in terms of tickets, yeah. But I do wonder if like it was lesser known actor. Like basically, if it wasn't like Harry Styles, if it hadn't have had a load of gossip come out about it. I hope that hasn't had a negative impact on like my feelings towards the story in the film. I don't think it has, but then part of me is like, am I just like not being as giving it as much praise because of these other things that I know? Holding it to more scrutiny. Yeah, I yeah. hope I'm not, but like I might, I don't know, I might be. Well, uh, yeah, I would love to hear from everybody who listens to this podcast what their thoughts are on it without taking in mind what we've said, but like what your initial thoughts were on the actual film. Cause I still haven't made my mind up about it because like when I came out of the cinema, there were things that we immediately were like, this doesn't, I'm like ups, but it was more whenever I picked something that I, I had, a, I was confused at. It was more like, I wish I want someone to have an answer because I loved everything else. And if I could just have an answer to like why Gemma Chan did that, is there a sequel? Or like, you know, if I just had more explanation on some of these tiny little things. And I don't think it's even in a like, the director needs to explain absolutely everything and everything needs to be tied up. Not even that, but it's like, it's so ambiguous in places that it just, it doesn't feel deliberate. It feels like something got lost in translation. And, but it's, but it's really because there was so many bits that I loved. It's like, it's the it's the finishing details. And maybe the reason why we're going into those finishing details is because of all the scrutiny on this film. I would say like, that's completely fair. Um, but hey, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I actually need to ask is, if you were in that world and then you realize that that was not the real world, but your reality or reality indeed, was drab and grey and terrible. Would you want to stay in that world and would you? Listen, for comedy's sake, I'm going to say it, I would stay. I, yeah. <laughs> but like, I really love my job, even on the worst days. So I know that I wouldn't really, but it's funnier to be like, yeah, I'd stay. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it does kind of like, fair enough to Bunny that she's like, yeah. well, yeah. yeah I'm like, true, true. fair play, yeah. Because really, like, is anything real? No, not like, <gasps> but no, not that. <laughs> but you know, like, it is It is only like your memories and I don't know, get a bit like weird and deep, but like, if it's your reality, it's your reality. Like go with whatever you want. I don't think I would enjoy cooking all the time. <laughs> oh, I see, as in like, if that was your date, you had to be like mm. one of the women. I would be bored. I would be very bored. I mean, you don't like cooking anyway, so... That's what I'm saying. That would, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, if they had just... If they had let women write the code of the world as well... Yeah. Because who says? Why can't they just code in that the food, like, gets delivered to them every night? Why do they have... Why do the girls have to... Oh, well, then I'd live in that. Yeah. For sure. Why can't we just code a simulation and we all live there and we all decide what we do each day? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Then I'd stay. Great. But it's the lion. I can't. Yeah, remember. I don't know. And also if it was in that exact place, like there wasn't masses of spaces to go, but it was just like a load of buildings together. And then like, a, you'd get a bit bored of that one place. Actually, no, I'm not going there. I guess it's just supposed to be a holding pen for their ladies though. Boring. Why do they do that? Boring. Yeah. Yawn. So the general consensus is we wouldn't go, th we wouldn't stay there. But if there was like an alternate reality w which we could create <laughs> that we would stay there mm. and asleep in the real world. Well, great. Um, final thoughts. Everyone should go and watch it. And I think that we love to not love things a little too much. And this movie is like a victim of that for sure. But I think that there are some really, really, really special elements that will last a really long time. And you know what? They could make a movie that's like better, but no one saw it. And like, as cinema is dying, like this is, is what we got. Well, it felt like a movie. <laughs> the movie felt like a movie, to be fair. So <laughs> To be fair, when you said it did, it did feel like a movie. I think that 
I'm excited to see Olivia Wilde make another film. This was only her second feature. So like, everyone like, stop being a dick. Like, give her a chance. And also like, it was still really good in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of questionable parts about it with the story with, yeah, all the bits that we've just spoken about. And like, yeah. I I wanted it. I I would love for them to do like, to have done another pass on the script maybe to make sure that it was like solid story before they went and shot it. Um, yeah, but like fair play. All of the elements were there and they were done incredibly well. Something in the mixing of the soup did not quite work, but that does not take away from all of those elements being, being really good. It's not your bag of soup. Is it? <laughs> um, yes. I really agree as well. I'm so glad that I saw it in the cinema. Um, I think visually it is like really like one of my faves that I've seen in the last, well, recent times. I think that world is just so beautiful. What she's done there is amazing. But yeah, it was um, a, li a little bit of a letdown. I'm not gonna lie. So you you said uh, I'm excited to see what um what Olivia Wilde does next. Yeah. So she's directing a film which is about U.S. gymnastics, which I'm really excited about. Oh, cool. You watched that documentary, yeah? Is it about that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm really excited about. That. And she's also doing a Marvel project. Oh wow! Yeah, which has been announced, but not announced. Announced just that she's attached to do a Marvel project. Well, listen, she ain't slowing down. Uh -uh. None of this is going to hold her back. And I think that that's what it's all about. Well, thank you so much for joining us for that episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we're going to be watching Boiling Point, which was written and directed by Phil Barantini, who's going to be joining us on the show. Um, so give it a watch. It's on Netflix. I hope you enjoy and see you next week. This podcast was presented by Wrapped.